Greetings. Welcome to Tradition Today. Today we have the great pleasure of having with us Father Alexander Warnicke, the pastor of St. Peter and Paul, Russian Orthodox Church here in Syracuse. When we look and reflect upon traditions, we should always think about our past. And what greater person should we have to study about the past of the Orthodox Church and the establishment of Orthodoxy here in the central New York area than one of our senior clergymen uh, from this area, Father Warnicke. Welcome. My pleasure. I hope we enjoy our presence here to be able to witness to our faith to everybody, including our parishioners. We wanted to know, as I was curious, uh, being new to Syracuse area, uh, if you could take us through a little bit the beginnings of uh, your ministry here when you came, and a little bit about the establishment of the Orthodox community in Syracuse. Well, the Orthodox Church itself has its presence here since 1915. In June 1915, you have a small group of Russian immigrants deciding to establish a church in Syracuse because they were traveling to Auburn and it was a, quite a task and they couldn't have all of the services that they felt were required. So they felt, after talking with the Archbishop Metropolitan, that they should begin a parish of their own in Syracuse. The parish was first meeting at Trinity Episcopal Church, and they discussed first the Brotherhood, which they organized, the St. Latimer Brotherhood, which was the facilitator of their establishing a parish. And then it was necessary for them to seek to have their own property since the demand became greater than they expected. And within six months, they already were seeking property and bought some property in June of 1916. And the parish had its beginning when they had two houses on Park Avenue located where presently we have the Fraser School. And one of the houses was converted to a church the other was readied for the residence of the rector of the parish and the janitor. It was a two-family house. And with that beginning, Orthodoxy had its first roots in Syracuse from the Russian immigrants who came here to labor in the forests of uh, the north, in the factories in Syracuse, and the gas company, steel mill, and orthodoxy began to grow with their decision to establish this parish in Syracuse. Now I know from past experiences that in many times Syracuse is our major city here, but in the outlining outskirts we have a metropolitan area. Uh, now how far of a territory would you say that the, uh, the priest of the Syracuse area, how far did you have to minister? Well the priests if right throughout the history of Saints Peter and Paul Parish have ministered to people in Oneida, Durhamville, Fulton, Oswego, uh, further to Victory, Cato, Cortland, all of these. But they also ministered at first or primarily to their own ethnic Russians. But as time went on, they began to minister to other national groups, the Bulgarians, the Serbians, the so-called Max Macedonians, and in general, they were located also in all of these cities around Syracuse, not right in the city, but there, we are not a, say, parish, of a local parish just around a few blocks of the church. We are all throughout this central New York area. This is one thing that, uh, you, you know how true it is, that I, I get calls at church many times. And uh, since I'm in a Greek Orthodox parish, I'd get people saying, do I have to speak Greek or do I have to be Greek to be Orthodox? And we know nowadays that uh, the answer that they receive, but since you brought us in this broad perspective that we have, uh, actually our parishes are not just a local church in one little area or one city. We, are, we have almost a diaspora uh, around a, a metropolitan area. But I know um, 
as, as the parish starts to grow, the Syracuse becomes like the mother church, and we have little communities throughout uh, the area. It also, I think, uh, gives our, your people the opportunity to uh, not only build their own parishes here, but now start to expand and get involved in the church, the mother church. Can you tell us a little bit how that developed as, as the, your parish was settled here, how they got involved in the archdiocese and some of the other projects? Well, at first, there was this tr traveling to Auburn. And when the Archbishop came to Auburn, he told the people from Syracuse, well, why don't you organize your own parish in Syracuse? He said, well, we don't have the money to pay a priest. The Archbishop said, well, you don't have to worry about paying the priest. We have funds that we get from Russia. Each year, in those days, $75,000, which then were used to supplement the needs of the parish and to pay the salaries of the pre clergy. So until 1923, although the revolution took place in 17, there was the $75,000 available, first from Russia and then from places like Switzerland and Italy where there were Russian funds to support the church in its missionary effort in America. Of course, the church this year is celebrating 200 years of presence in America with the first churches beginning in Alaska where the fur traders were ministered to by missionaries, monks from Russia. But after the churches were promised this money, it was an incentive for them to go out and buy the property, begin a parish. But in 1923, when the money ran out, well, first of all, the local parish say, well, hey, you were promised we were going to pay, take care of our salaries. What are we going to do now? So, well, now things have changed. You've got to pay. The other churches all at that time were under the jurisdiction of the Russian Orthodox Church of Russia. This was a, a missionary field. But when the money ran out, again, each church said, well, we've got to establish our own whole household. And then you have the churches in 1923 breaking up and beginning their own parishes. Of course, the Greek community was organized here in Syracuse in about 1916. Uh, you have the Arabic community, Orthodox community, organized in about 1926-27. You have, uh, after that, also the appearance of a church in exile, or the Synodal Church, which resulted in establishing another parish, St. Mary's Parish, which actually continues to serve in Slavonic, with some exceptions, and it also had a different administrative structure. Further, you had the organization of a, a church of St. Serge and St. Herman, converts from other nationalities, other churches, and they became an Orthodox parish here in East Syracuse. You have the Macedonian parish, which really used to be uh, part of our parish. They, we decided to, esta uh, uh, to establish a church with their own national ethnic back background. Of course, there were Serbs and there were Macedonian Bulgarians. So you had little problems there, differences in politics, but still the Serbian parish finally established itself. The Bulgarian parish, of course, just lost out. St. Mary's parish went uh, because of the lack of participants was uh, swallowed up by, say, the other churches in the Orthodox churches in Syracuse. You have also a Ukrainian Orthodox church. It's a, something that came here after World War II when you had immigrants from Ukraine. There were two Orthodox churches for a while. One was St. Nicholas Church on Butternut Street, and then there was St. Luke's Church, which was first on Lowell Avenue, then it moved in, to Warner's, New York, where they've established a church, a hall, a cemetery, and they've done very well as an ethnic church. And of course, we hope sincerely that the Greek Orthodox community, the so-called former Russian Orthodox community, which we are, the Orthodox Church in America, and the Antiochian Orthodox Church, together with the other churches, will be able to work together more closely to be able to have a greater presence and a greater witness of Orthodoxy here in America. I know one of the one of the great traditions today of uh, having our churches. You, you mentioned that the clergyman was supported by the mother church in Russia, 
and even salaries and monies was sent to help. But as you know, like any place Orthodoxy has been in all over the world, it always had to be the people of that particular area that established the church. And one of the most important lifelines of any church is its seminary. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, St. Vladimir's Seminary and uh, some of the things that you uh, yes. do there and participate? St. Vladimir's Seminary had its beginning only in 1938 because the seminary of the Russian Orthodox Church in America, which existed in Tenafly, New Jersey, was a victim of the dissipation of the funds which were not available and they had to close in 1923. So with the establishment of St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York as a full seminary and a pastor's school at St. Tichon's Monastery in Pennsylvania, we began our own training of theological students for our churches. Of course, uh, the number of students at first were not many, 8, 10, 12, and finally now we've reached the point where we're over 100. And of course, some of us have gone to St. Vladimir Seminary where, of course, uh, you have a full program for graduate theological students, and it is a center of orthodoxy in the world uh, where the theologians are called throughout the world and in for the World Council of Churches of Faith and Order movement, as well as in pan-Orthodox conferences and centers to be able to present orthodoxy to the widest variety of intellectually prepared people. The seminary itself teaches completely in English. Everything is in English at St. Latimer Seminary. Uh, we have a development fund going on now to buy additional property and to be able to build a married student housing program and also to build a new library because the library is too small. We have so many volumes. I've been active in the seminary because it's my alma mater, but because more so because it is a great, great fountain of the orthodoxy for all of us. And the students there are not of Russian background, they're every background. In fact, I might say that of over 50% of the present student body comes from other traditions, not the orthodox tradition. They have become members of the orthodox church and have decided they want to study for the orthodox priesthood. So we're pleased to see that orthodoxy is beginning to take its place not only as an ethnic religion or necessarily to be carried on with ethnic groups, but by the mainstream America. And we hope that this will be able to present to the world orthodoxy in its best fashion. I am still active as a trustee of the seminary. I'm the secretary of the corporation, and I continually look forward to helping to develop this institution so that it will shine forth the faith of our fathers for us and for future generations as well. Yeah, that's great. I, uh, as a uh, as a younger clergyman, it's uh, it's always wonderful to have a, a priest that's uh, been blessed with many years of ministry. And I'm always curious, and I'm sure many many people are that, as you saw, you said you gave us a great history of how Orthodoxy started with different ethnic groups. Uh, but now, as we look at the present time, as uh, today of Orthodoxy, we start to see that no longer are we bound by just our ethnic ties. Uh, we start seeing that orthodoxy is uh, becoming universal in this country. Uh, perhaps the language barrier has been broken now. No longer Greeks only speak Greek, no longer Russians only speak Russian, uh, no, their native tongues. But now uh, we're American born and we have that in common. But orthodoxy itself is starting to bring us together. What do you see or foresee that is happening today that obviously couldn't happen before. And how do you see that so lead us to the future? Well, there has been a sort of a ethnic rivalry in trying to outdo each other, in trying to have a seminary, have libraries, have camps. And of course, we have St. Andrew's Camp up on Oneida Lake, which is we're sort of glad to have for service to our Orthodox people, Orthodox children. As last summer, we had 19 children come from Russia and spent three weeks at our camp. Uh, we hope we have Greeks coming there, we have people from other backgrounds, and even now on the top level, the Standing Conference of Orthodox Bishops is presently working on a program to 
use our common resources, financial and intellectual, to establish a, the highest possible theological institution for educating our clergy and theologians in America. Archbishop Yakovus of the Greek Church, Metropolitan Philip of the Antiochian Church, and Metropolitan Theodosius of the Orthodox Church in America are expected to meet shortly to work out a plan as to how to use all of these spiritual and financial assets to the glory of God and for the furtherance of the Orthodox faith. That's one thing. Secondly, there is an interchange of clergy, the faculty going from one seminary to the other seminary to teach and to witness the traditions and the faith to the other seminarians. So we have this common bind, bound, uh, bind to be able to work together for the glory of God. We put out religious education material. Here in Syracuse, we are distributors for Orthodox Christian Education Commission. This institution puts out religious education material for children and young adults throughout the world. We have this happening in many, many areas. There are, there's, a great, there's a great charitable drive to help the people of Russia, the Church of Russia, the Greeks, the Antiochians, the Russians, Americans, all have somehow rallied around the International Orthodox Charitable Fund to be able to produce funds for the restoration of the churches, which were 70 years not tended to under the Soviet regime, the communist regime, and which are in dire need of funds to establish and reestablish the communities. All of the churches in Russia have been given back to the by the government to the church, and there's great need for financial help. So all of us are trying hard as one Orthodox witness to be able to help them to continue the Orthodox faith there. There's no need for missionaries from other churches to go there. Orthodoxy is the Church of Christ on earth, as Father Florovsky, my former mentor, told, told us. And there is need for us to take that Orthodoxy and make it visible and make it also obviously not just a theoretical or a historical religion, but a religion that motivates us in every day of our life. Yeah, we see many times that uh, sometimes through tragedy that things are exposed, sometimes it's through the uh, glory of celebrating. And since Russia went through its millennium celebrating its thousand years, that it was always on the media and uh, in the forefront of our, our great medium of t television. And uh, just recently, uh, uh, the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, had visited uh, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries. But he mentioned himself that how he was at the church, that he went and visited the church. And uh, because of the passing away of his mother's, uh, his mom, that someone, one of the priests, directed him to light a candle in memoria, and how it uh, helped him and comforted him spiritually. So uh, I've observed that, indeed, orthodoxy has been coming to the forefront of, of uh, American life. Uh, I know you've seen uh, great changes in the city. Even physically, uh, you know that many times uh, our parishes were located in inner city places, uh, as St. Paul and uh, Peter and Paul is today, right? You're still in the, in, the, in the city, and a lot of other parishes have moved out in the suburbs. And, uh, and one way I think we're losing our, um, our identity and our influence in, within the cities, but uh, hopefully, one of the things that I'm hoping to see, since we as Orthodox are becoming more alive with each other, that we can have a greater presence within our inner cities and start to reopen our parishes in the city uh, instead of closing and moving them out in the suburbs. But uh, do you foresee that our next mission work here in America is not going to be just for the Orthodox people here, but for uh, people who don't know Orthodoxy? Well, this is our prime concern that we have to witness to all peoples we know no distinction in race or color. We all worship God in spirit and in truth, and we believe that God has made one race, and that's the human race. And as humans, we all must work together and try to facilitate <coughs> the lives of the indigent, the poor, and the less fortunate in the best way we can. And the Orthodox faith should be anxious to welcome all comers who desire the church to present its witness to them and make them aware of the great spiritual wealth and treasury of orthodoxy. 
I just, you mentioned the President of the United States. He's in Russia now, and I just talked to someone in Moscow, our representative in Moscow today, and he said the President was at the hospital where Patriarch Alexei is, is uh, presently uh, housed because of his, uh, he's ill with pneumonia, and he was supposed to, supposed, supposed to spend 10 minutes with him according to the schedule, but he stayed 40 minutes and talked with the, the Patriarch of uh, Patriarch Alexei II of Moscow. It was really thrilling for me to hear that we do receive some recognition from even such a high authorities, our president. Well, that's great, because uh, I think anybody realized for people to be great, not only financially we have to be great as a nation, but spiritually people have to be moved, uh, because it creates a whole person, as God created us from, uh, from the beginning. But uh, it, it's a great uh, pleasure that all of us as Orthodox can uh, strive for this common unity that now we do have and share with each other. And I think as time goes on, uh, you know, it was Martin Luther King that he came out and said he had a dream. But I think for us as Orthodox, we have a dream that uh, someday all of us will be able to uh, pray at the same altar, uh, to share in the, from the same cup, and indeed to, to grow uh, together as one church here in the United States. I see this happening in my lifetime, uh, Father, and I see it happening uh, uh, soon. But uh, it's, it's a great honor, for, like you said, for clergymen like yourself that really held on to the teachings of the church. But again, people will ask you, how do I become Orthodox, or what requirements are there for me to become Orthodox or join this, this great movement that's happened? Well, we know that you just don't jump off the boat and go to communion or come from the dance and go to communion, there is preparation. Anything that is good requires preparation. Anything that you need in life more than religion is, of course, temporary and very very short-lived. You've got to have something more permanent. And what is permanent and eternal is the Christian faith. And we in the Orthodox Church say that the faith of our fathers is indeed the faith which has continued in the course of history from the time of Christ until now without change, adulteration, or addition. It doesn't mean that we haven't deviated, we haven't sinned. We all, St. Paul says, all have sinned, we've sinned. But the faith remains intact, and the faith of our fathers is passed on from Christ to the apostles to the holy fathers of the church in the course of history he is guiding us, leading us, and we're looking forward to our being able to represent the church as they represented it in the course of history so that Orthodox will continue to remain steadfast in its holding to the true faith of Christ and the faith of, of the apostles. We are the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So for one to join, they need to what? They Take have to, test, first of all, of course, contact the priest, make the appointment, discuss the, the religious faith, to learn about the church, what its teachings are. Well, we just uh, had that experience, a new experience when the ballet was here from Russia and the Nutcracker Suite members were anxious to get in touch with us at the church. At first we had two individuals that declared that they wanted to be baptized. And then when it came time to, for the baptism to take place, one of the two could not be here because she had to go in the advance party, but there were three others. So they want to get baptized. And, uh, you just don't baptize people that want to be baptized. We require some kind of preparation. But we did spend about an hour with them and spoke to them in Russian, gave them the Nicene Creed in Russian, asked them to read it, asked them, to the, asked them some questions, explained to them what it says. And if, as long as you believe what it says in this Nicene Creed, we can uh, baptize you. And we baptized three young ladies, three ballerinas, and one of the ballet dancers, a few male dancers. And this was a new experience for us, too, that they had received their instruction in a very short time. St. Paul was converted in a very short time. But normal people usually come and receive instruction in the faith, in the doctrine, as well as the history, and liturgical practices of the church, so that we have a good understanding of the faith before we say, you are ready to be baptized. And when they are ready to be baptized, we accept baptism from any Trinitarian church 
And in cases you've been baptized by a, in the Trinitarian Church, then you are received in the church through chrismation. So again, we have to explain these things to all the candidates. We're a little lax in doing this, I must confess, but we've got to be out there doing more to give people the opportunity to know Orthodoxy and to become members of the Orthodox Church. Yes, I, I, uh, I thank you for that response because many times people are aware of the, of the work that we are to do overseas. For example, you spoke about your trip. Uh, I know you have personal experience of being in uh, Moscow and uh, in other parts of, uh, of the Soviet Union at that time. But can you tell us a little bit about, about the church there? It's tied because we have families that are still yeah. uh, have ties there. But what I, really what I'm leading, uh, trying to lead you to is a few years ago, there was a great pressure to evangelize and to Christianize Russia. And uh, unfortunately, I'm going to say to you is that uh, many of our Christian uh, brethren from the United States, being a Protestant background, other church, immediately wanted to go to Russia to, s to teach, send them the gospel without realizing that indeed the church was there. It just needs to be uh, revamped. And like you said, buildings have to be open for museums and put back into houses of worship. Could you kind of give us a little background on that? Well, I've been in Russia several times. I've been in Russia since 73. In 1973, uh, when I visited Moscow, there were seven working churches in Moscow. On my last visit there in June of 1993, there were 499 churches open. Of wow. course, this is a far cry from what Moscow had before the revolution. Before the revolution, there were 40 40s. There were 1,600 churches and chapels. So, but now the churches are filled. The churches are singing in the glory of God. They're worshiping and everyone is, the monasteries are filled. Converts are filled. We got a lot of nuns. We got a lot of monks. And glory to God in the highest, we have a wonderful opportunity to let them again be the holy church as they were some time ago. This is great. What a great opportunity we had uh, to spend some moments together today in this uh, wonderful show, Tradition Today. I know that uh, perhaps since you bring us so many good news and good things about in your own ministry that you've seen that even here in Syracuse, maybe perhaps we can see the Orthodox Church grow from four or five communities to 400 communities, because that's, uh, that's our dream now as our generation, that indeed we spread the message of, uh, of Christ and the hope and the wonderful beauty that uh, God gives us and the eternal life that he offers to us. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, Father, for being with us and sharing time with you. I know that you make yourself available for people that uh, would like to ask for tours of the church and even the other uh, Orthodox churches here in Syracuse. They can contact the parish and ask for a tour of the wonderful iconography that you have and the other Orthodox churches also have. Uh, so uh, God bless you for many years of uh, fruitful ministry that you have, and I'm glad that you joined us here. Thank you. Thank you and thank you. God bless you and God bless all of our listeners. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless you. Good night.